Heisman week continues and we're back today with another Heisman video. Today we're going to be talking about 10 players who I picked that should have won the Heisman trophy but sadly didn't. Before we get to today's video make sure to click that subscribe button and turn on those notifications so you never miss another video. I'm posting one Heisman video each day leading up to the Heisman ceremony on Tuesday so you definitely don't want to miss any of these videos that are coming. There's no ranking for these 10 players as I don't think one is more deserving than another. There is no order so I'm just going to be sharing with you guys the 10 players who I think should have won the Heisman trophy. We're going to kick this list off with Christian McCaffrey, who I personally believe is one of the biggest snubs in recent memory. He lost in 2015 to Alabama running back Derrick Henry. McCaffrey finished in second place with 290 first place votes and a total of 1,539 points. Let's compare the numbers between the two backs. You also have to remember that Derrick Henry did play one more game than Christian McCaffrey, so all these games didn't necessarily impact the Heisman, since a few of them were played after the voting was due. Derrick Henry rushed for 2,219 yards on 5.6 yards per carry, whereas McCaffrey rushed for 2,019 yards on 6.0 yards per carry. So right around the same mark, with Christian McCaffrey averaging nearly half a yard more per rush. The biggest difference immediately though goes to the rushing touchdowns, where Henry finished with a total of 28 and McCaffrey had only 8. However, the reason for this is because Stanford used Raymond Wright on the goal line most of the time as he had 13 rushing touchdowns. If you were to take him out of the equation and give all those to CMC, he'd have 21. Still, it wouldn't be as much as Henry's 28, but it would look a whole lot nicer than only 8. Now, this is the part where McCaffrey really takes over. He caught 45 passes compared to Derrick Henry's 11. He also had 645 receiving yards compared to Henry's 91. CMC had 5 receiving touchdowns, whereas Henry had 0. Just for fun, McCaffrey had 2 touchdown passes as well. Then we move over to the return game where CMC really did his damage. He had over 1,000 kick return yards, averaging just under 30 yards a carry. So every time McCaffrey fielded a kick, Stanford usually would be at least on the 30 yard line. McCaffrey also housed one for a touchdown. Though it wasn't as much damage, he still added 130 punt return yards and had a punt return touchdown as well. Not only did he break the record for most total yards in a season, he absolutely shattered it. Barry Sanders held the previous record with 3,251 yards of total offense in a season. That record stood for almost 30 years. McCaffrey finished the season with 3,864, a number that we very well could never see broken in our lifetime. We haven't seen a wide receiver win the Heisman since Desmond Howard back in 19. However, that very well could change in a few days. The wait shouldn't have been as long though, as Pittsburgh wide receiver Larry Fitzgerald should have won back in 2003. He barely lost, coming in second place to Oklahoma quarterback Jason White. Fitzgerald lost by a little less than 130 points, which is a really, really close race. Fitzgerald was by far the best wide receiver in college football in 2013, and was arguably the best overall player in the country as well. He catches the most in the Big East, and the fifth most in the nation. He led the country in receiving yards with 1,672. His 22 touchdowns were by far the most, as the next closest player had only 16. His 18.2 yards per catch were the most in the FBS among players with at least 65 catches. Fitzgerald was responsible for 132 points, the most in the entire country. During the 2003 season, he had at least 100 receiving yards in 10 games and caught a touchdown in every game but one. There were 8 games in which Fitzgerald caught at least 2 touchdowns. What really hurt his chances was the fact that Pittsburgh finished the season only 8-5. They started the season ranked 10th, but by October, they had fallen completely out of the top 25. A lot of players on this list finished in either 2nd or 3rd place, but our next player finished 5th. In 1956, Syracuse running back Jim Brown finished 5th in Heisman voting. The Heisman went to Notre Dame quarterback Paul Horning, who threw 4 times as many interceptions as he did touchdowns for a team that won only 2 games. Jim Brown was 3rd in the entire country in rushing yards with just under 1,000, and he did it playing in 2 fewer games than the top 2. His 13 rushing touchdowns tied him for the most in the nation, again, tied him with someone who played in 2 more games than he did. Syracuse was a really good team as well, as they finished the year ranked as the number 8 team in the country. There were 2 running backs who finished above Jim Brown on Heisman voting, but Brown's number were better than both. So, how is it possible that a player who put up better numbers than almost every running back in the entire country, and was on a team in the top 10, didn't win the Heisman? A lot of people over the years have said it was largely due to race. At the time, an African American had never won the Heisman Trophy. Did that have anything to do with it? I mean, come on, no way he should have finished behind those two running backs. Ironically, the first African American to ever win a Heisman Trophy was another Syracuse running back, Ernie Davis, who won it in 1962. 
he also finished with fewer rushing yards and fewer rushing touchdowns than Jim Brown did. One of the greatest NFL quarterbacks we've ever seen almost added a Heisman Trophy to his resume. Peyton Manning came in second place in Heisman voting back in 1997. He lost to Desmond Howard, the only defensive player to ever win the Heisman. Peyton was fourth in the country in passing yards as he threw for just over 3,800. He just missed the top spot though as he was about 150 yards shy of leading the country. His 36 passing touchdowns were the third most in the nation. In addition to being the best quarterback in all of college football, Tennessee was one of the best teams in the country. They won the SEC and played number two Nebraska in the Orange Bowl. What ultimately cost Manning the Heisman was his game against Florida early in the season. Manning was 0-3 against the Gators in his first three seasons and he had a chance to finally take them down and have his Heisman moment. Tennessee lost by 13 and Manning didn't have a great game. Though he had a strong finish to the season, everyone remembers how you are right at the end of the year. Charles Woodson, who was great all year, had his best game of the season against Ohio State. Woodson himself took down the number four Buckeyes. He set up their only offensive touchdown with a 37-yard catch in the second quarter. He scored their second touchdown on a 78-yard punt return in the second quarter. And in the third quarter, Woodson intercepted an Ohio State pass in the red zone. Play-by-play -play commentator Keith Jackson said he could not recall a bigger game being played by a player. However, many people still believe it should have been Peyton Manning who took home the Heisman that year. Up next, we have Tommy Frazier, quarterback for the Nebraska Corn. This 1995 Nebraska team may be one of the greatest teams we've ever seen in college football. They averaged 53 points a game and won by an average of just under 40 points a game. They went undefeated and won the national championship. And none of that is possible without Tommy Frazier. He finished in second place of the voting in 1995 behind Ohio State running back Eddie George. It was a pretty close race as George received 50 more first place votes and won by about 250 points. First off, I'm not saying Eddie George wasn't deserving of winning the award because he was. He rushed for just under 2,000 yards and had 24 rushing touchdowns. But as I mentioned, Frazier was the main reason Nebraska gave us one of the greatest seasons we've ever seen in the history of college football. He threw for 1,400 yards with 17 touchdowns touchdowns and four interceptions. He also added 600 yards on the ground and 14 rushing touchdowns. Those numbers won't really blow you away, but again, he was leading a team who was averaging more than 53 points a game. Hell, Nebraska was averaging 400 yards a game on the ground and 7 yards a carry, so there's a reason he did need to throw the ball more. Before we get to the next 5, if you could please take a second and give this video a thumbs up, I would greatly appreciate it. It only takes a second to do, and it really helps share this video with more college football fans. Darren McFadden came in 2nd place in back-to-back -back years in 2006 and 2007, so I'm going to combine this one for him. He should have won at least once, but I'll let you guys decide which one should give him the edge. Let's start with 2006. He finished in 2nd place to Ohio State quarterback Troy Smith. While Smith had a good season for Ohio State, his numbers were pretty underwhelming for a Heisman winning quarterback. He threw for only 2,500 yards and 30 touchdowns and really didn't do anything in the run game. Meanwhile, Darren McFadden was fifth in the country with just under 1,700 rushing yards. His 14 rushing touchdowns had him ranked in the top 15 as well. However, Darren McFadden actually split carries in the backfield. Felix Jones had over 150 carries on the season and added over 1,100 rushing yards. Had this just been McFadden's backfield, who knows how much better his numbers could have looked. However, this was still arguably the best running back in the entire country. The following year, he was just as good, if not better. That year, he rushed for over 1,800 yards, the fourth most in the country. He upped his touchdown numbers as well, rushing for 16 touchdowns. Yet again, he was splitting carries with Felix Jones, who added over 1,100 rushing yards yet again. McFadden lost to Tebow, who finished the season with a total of 55 total touchdowns. So yeah, actually, after hearing that, why don't we say he deserved it over Troy Smith instead? Still, this is one of the best two-year stretches we've ever seen from a college running back. Herschel Walker ended up winning a Heisman Trophy, so it's all good. But you can make the case his freshman campaign was better than his junior winning season. In 1980, Walker finished third in Heisman voting as a true freshman. South Carolina running back George Rogers came in first place, with Hugh Green, a defensive lineman from Pittsburgh, coming in second place. Herschel was third in the country in both rushing yards and rushing touchdowns. As a true freshman, he was the entire Georgia Bulldogs offense. And when I say that, I really mean it. He was actually their only offense. He ran the ball 274 times that season. Georgia's quarterback, Buck Ballou, had a total of 77 completions on the season. That's right, 77. They barely threw the ball because they relied on Herschel Walker so much. The Bulldogs finished the season undefeated and took down Notre Dame in the Sugar Bowl to win the national championship. Again, I get he ended up winning the Heisman a few years later, but you can make the case that his freshman season was the most valuable of the three. Because he was a freshman at the time, it really hurt his chances. George Rogers was a senior and so was Hugh Green, so the voters gave the edge to the upperclassmen. Marshall Fall is one of the best running backs in college football history and he should have had a Heisman to his name. The problem? He played for San Diego State. 
The other problem, the Aztecs finished the season 5-5-1 five, five, in 1992. That season, he finished second in the voting behind Miami quarterback Gino Toretta, who, to put it simply, shouldn't have won the award. He threw for only 3,000 yards with only 19 touchdowns. After rushing for 1,400 yards as a freshman, Falk led the country in rushing yards with 1,600 during the 1992 year while also adding 15 rushing touchdowns as well. Although Falk was the best running back in the country, we've seen much better seasons from running backs who didn't win the Heisman. However, they didn't finish behind a quarterback who won like Gino Toretta. This is another one of those cases of the player who won was deserving, but man, it really should have gone to someone else. Lamar Jackson won the Heisman in 2016, and like I said, he deserved it. But he won the Heisman in the first month of the season and should have lost it in the final month of the season. Deshaun Watson is who should have won instead. Lamar Jackson ran away with the vote, but Watson was the better quarterback throughout the season, most importantly, at the end. Watson did play in two more games than Jackson, but he threw over 1,000 more yards and had 11 more passing touchdowns than Lamar. Jackson definitely had Watson beat on the ground, as he doubled him in rushing yards and rushing touchdowns. However, like I mentioned, what we saw in the last month, it should have cost Lamar Jackson the Heisman. On November 12th, Lamar had one touchdown against Wake Forest. The following week, he had one touchdown against Houston and lost. He did have four touchdowns the following week against Kentucky, but he threw three costly interceptions and lost for the second straight week. Now, Deshaun did lose a game in November, but it was a game-winning field goal to Pittsburgh. Watson threw for just under 600 yards with three touchdowns that game, so we're going to cut him some slack on that. He then closed the season with a three-touchdown victory over Wake Forest, a six-touchdown win over South Carolina, and a five-touchdown victory in the ACC Championship over Virginia Tech. The voters fell in love with Lamar after his hot start to the season, especially his performance against Florida State. But with how he played the last few weeks of the year compared to Deshaun Watson, I think it should have gone to the Clemson quarterback. Oh, and when the two quarterbacks faced off against each other, Watson totaled 400 yards with five touchdowns and, most importantly, came out with the win. Well, we started this list with a stand for running back, so I think it's fitting that we end with another Stanford running back. Toby Gerhardt finished in second place in 2009 in the closest Heisman Trophy race of all time. Mark Ingram took home the award from Alabama. Gerhardt finished just five first place votes behind Ingram and only 28 points behind him in total. When comparing numbers, it shouldn't even be a conversation. Gerhardt led the country in rushing yards with 1,871 and was first in the country with 28 rushing touchdowns. The difference was the record between the teams. Alabama went undefeated and won the national championship. Stanford, they lost five games. However, what also hurt Gerhardt was the fact that this was arguably one of the greatest Heisman finishes of all time. Colt McCoy had a fantastic season for Texas and received 203 first place votes, finishing in third place. He took a lot of votes away from Gerhardt. Another player who had a fantastic season was Ndamukong Sue, who received 161 first place votes as well. Any four of those players in the top four were deserving of the award, but I think Toby Gerhardt was the one that was most deserving in 2009. Well, those are the 10 players who I think should have won a Heisman Trophy. What do you guys think of this list? Who are players I didn't mention that you think were deserving of winning the Heisman, but didn't? Let me know in the comments down below. If you haven't done so yet, if you could please take a second and give this video a thumbs up, I would greatly appreciate it. Also, if you haven't done so yet, don't forget to click that subscribe button and turn on those notifications. I'll be posting college football content here every day, so if you're a huge college football fan, this is definitely the place for you. As always, thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll see you all in my next video.